We're going to cover the Greek polis. Um, in this video, we'll go over political structures, colonization Greeks did, democratic institutions, Peloponnesian Wars. See, the Greek city-states developed different forms of governance with very different political structures and strengths. Greek colonization led to the spread of the Greek language and Greek culture, but it also resulted in tensions with the neighboring Persian Empire, culminating in the Persian War. Athens developed democratic institutions and a cultural philosophy, science, and culture. It emerged as a powerful state and allied with other city-states forming the Delian League. Resistance to Athens' power among the other Greek states, particularly Sparta, prompted the Pen Peloponnesian War. So that's what this video will be about. First, the rise of the polis. The territory of Greece is mountainous. As a result, ancient Greece consisted of many smaller regions, each with its own dialect, cultural peculiarities, and identity. Regionalism and regional conflicts were a prominent feature of ancient Greece. Cities tended to be located in valleys between mountains or on coastal plains and dominated the countryside around them. According to the legendary poet Homer, not Homer Simpson, whose historical authenticity is debated, around 1200 BC, the Mycenaeans were involved in a conflict with the city of Troy in Anatolia called the Trojan War. As Homer wrote in his famous work, The Iliad, at the same time as the war, various foreign sea peoples began invading Mycenaean settlements, prompting the inhabitants to migrate to islands in the Aegean, Anatolia, and Cyprus. At that time, writing seemed to have disappeared, and life in the Greek peninsula and Greek islands was characterized by conflict and instability, the Dark Ages, for Greece. This instability was <coughs> the context for the emergence of the Greek city-states. Without a powerful centralized state, smaller governing bodies created political order out of this mess. One type of governing body was the city-state or polis. Polis is a city-state. Initially, the term polis referred to a fortified area or citadel, which offered protection during times of war. Because of the relative safety of these structures, people flocked to them and set up communities or commercial centers around them. Over time, polices, or that's plural polis, you know, many cities became urban centers whose power and influence extended to the surrounding agricultural regions, which provided resources and paid taxes. By around 800 BC, there were many polis um, which functioned independently. In response to their own specific contexts, each city state created a different form of governance ranging from monarchies and oligarchies to militaristic societies and proto-democracies. Monarchies were sometimes ruled by a tyrant, which is a ruler who did not follow any set laws. Oligarchies were small groups of powerful individuals who ran city-state government. Oligarchies and tyrants often competed for power. Democracies were governments that allowed citizens to vote on and participate in making state decisions. Some of the most important city-states were Athens, Sparta, Thebes, Corinth, and Delphi. Of these, Athens and Sparta were the two most powerful. Athens was a democracy and Sparta had two kings in an oligarch system but both were important in the development of Greek society and culture. This map shows some of the many city-states of ancient Greece and includes the places that various characters from the Iliad that Homer wrote and the Odyssey, which Homer also wrote, were supposed to have come from. So if you see here, Anatolia, 
the Trojan War happened over here. And the Greeks, the Mycenaeans, came from over here, the Greek islands. Each one of these little regions is a city-state. We'd covered a tyrant, someone who fall, um, a ruler who set, follows no set law. They do whatever they want, like a dictator. Oligarchies, a small group of individuals who run a government, very powerful individuals. In democracies, where the people have a voice and choose decisions for the government. Let's talk about Sparta. Located in a fertile area of the Peloponnese, that's a peninsula in southern Greece, Sparta's population steadily grew between 800 and 600 BC. As Sparta developed a complex and strong economy and extended its power throughout the Peloponnese and brought the people of neighboring villages under its control, pretty much enslaving everyone around them. Uh, the people in these villages, however, were not accorded equal status with Spartans. Instead, they became helots, who were a class of unfree laborers, slaves. Unlike the enslaved people who were owned privately, helots were subjects of the start Spartan state, so it's owned by the government, not an individual. They were able to have families and exercise some degree of freedom, but they were tied to the land and were required to supply Sparta with food, much like serfs in medieval Europe. Spartans expanded, expended vast resources to develop a powerful and structured military apparatus to re prevent and subdue rebellions. Most of the population were slaves of the state, after all. Now, there was a, sh a very sharp distinction between Spartans and Helots. Spartan society itself did not have a complex social hierarchy, at least in theory. Instead of wealth being a distinguishing marker, social status was determined by military achievements. Strength and discipline were emphasized even in children at a very young age. At seven, Spartan boys were separated from their families and sent to live in military camps where they underwent serious military training, leading up to active service when they were barely out of their teenage years. Though Spartan society did not have a rigid social hierarchy, it still had some influential groups. Like all Greek societies, Sparta was dominated by male citizens, and the most powerful of these came from the select group of families. The Spartan political system was unusual in that it had two hereditary kings from two separate families. These monarchs were part, um, particularly powerful when one of them led the army on campaign, and the other stayed to govern at home. The kings were also priests of Zeus, and they sat on the Council of Elders, known as a Gerusha, which was also the highest court in Sparta. So basically, they made the final say. They were the head of the religion and the state. There was also an executive committee of five ephors, chosen by lot from the citizen body, able only to serve for a maximum of one year, after which point they were ineligible for future office. Two of the ephors also accompanied one of the kings when on campaign. Just how these different political elements interacted is not known for certain, but clearly a degree of consciousness was necessary for the state apparatus to function. Consensus. They all had to get along for the state to function. Women in Sparta had more rights than women in other Greek city-states. In Sparta, they could own property, which they often gained through dowries and inheritance. Dowry is a gift when you're married. Some women became rich when the men in their families were killed in war. In fact, women eventually controlled nearly half of Spartan land. In addition, Spartan women could move around with reasonable freedom, wear non-constricting clothing, enjoy athletics, and even drink wine. So let's talk about Athens, the other most powerful state in Greece. Athens emerged as the dominant economic power in Greece around the late 6th century BC. Its power and wealth was further bolstered by the discovery of silver in the neighboring mountains. Athens was at the center of a 
efficient trading system with other Greek states. It's a trading empire. Trade was incredibly important for Athens, as it did not have the agricultural conditions for enough grain for its people. It couldn't feed its own people. It needed to trade for it, that food. Athens transitioned through different systems of government as its population grew and became wealthier through maritime trade. This wealth became increasingly concentrated in the hands of a few members of the aristocracy, who were also political leaders, leaving other members of society in debt, sometimes to the point of being forced into debt slavery. Further, there was a perceived lack of consistency among the laws of the city. The first series of laws written to address these inequalities was provided by the sta statesman Draco around 621 BC, but the laws were considered too severe. The penalty for most infractions was death. This is where we get the term draconian, unnecessarily cruel. An aristocrat named Solon was called upon to modify and revise these harsh laws. <coughs> Solon created a series of laws which equalized political power. Two of the changes for which Solon was responsible were the cancellation of debts and the abolition of debt slavery. He also created opportunities for some common people to participate in the government of Athens. In doing so, Solon laid the groundwork for democracy in Athens. Pericles led Athens between six... 461 and 429. Pericles, Athens, 461 to 429 BC. He was an incredibly well-liked leader, known for encouraging culture, philosophy, and science, for advocating for the common people. Under Pericles, Athens entered its golden age. Great thinkers, writers, and artists flourished in the city. Herodotus, the father of history, lived and wrote in Athens. Socrates, the father of philosophy, taught in the marketplace. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, practiced there. The sculptor Phidias created his great works for the Parthenon on the Acropolis and the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, one of the modern marvels of the time. Democritus envisioned an atomic universe. Scientists, philosophers, they're all uh, playwrights wrote their famous plays, Sophocles. This legend, this legacy continued as later Plato founded his academy outside the walls of Athens in 385 BC. And even later, Aristotle's Lyceum was founded in the city center. So some great universities for the time. Still, Athenian democracy was limited to its male citizens. Foreigners, enslaved people, and women were excluded from these institutions. Women's roles were largely confined to the private sphere, where they were responsible for raising children and managing the household, including enslaved people, if the household could afford them. While women of the upper class were often literate, most were not likely to receive an education beyond what was needed for the execution of their domestic duties. They required male chaperones to travel in public. Enslaved people, while not involved in political affairs, were integral to the Athenian economy. They cultivated the food, worked large construction projects, labored in mines and quarries. Enslaved people were the uh, present in most Athenian households as well, carrying out an array of domestic duties. Let's talk about the colonization. The Greeks go to the sea and they colonize other areas to get their resources, which is going to lead to some conflict, Persian Wars. So due to the increasing populations of the city-states, and the insufficient resources available, many Greeks began to look outward and create settlements outside of mainland Greece. Between the 8th and 6th century, hundreds of colonies were established on the coasts of the Mediterranean, the Black Seas. Later, Greek communities would settle in modern-day Sicily and southern Italy. Even as far as modern-day southern France, eventually more Greeks lived in these settlements than on mainland Greece. So they were really big colonizers. More people lived on the colonies than in Greece itself.
Greek colonization invigorated the networks of trade and exchange throughout the Mediterranean. Greek language and culture spread throughout the region because of this trade. However, it also brought conflict and tension with the Persian Empire. Uh, um, starting a two-decade-long Persian War from 500 to 479 BC, a Persian consolidated as Persia consolidated its control over its conquests in Anatolia and Mesopotamia, Greek communities living in the area of Anatolia, specifically an island called Ionia, resisted the Persian rule. To support the Ionian Greeks, the Athenians sent their impressive fleet, which prompted retribution from the Persians. The ensuing conflict drew in other Greek city-states, most notably Sparta. Conflict between Greeks and Persians continued for over a hundred years. It all started because they came to fist over the island of Ionia. The Delian League and the Peloponnesian War need to be brought up. Though the Greek city-states were unified to some extent in the face of an external threat, like Persian Empire, conflicts between the city-states made a resurgence, so they started to fight each other. Following the wars, Athens emerged as the supreme naval power in Greece, formed the Delian League, ostensibly to create a cohesive Greek network among city-states to ward off further Persian attacks. Under the leadership of Pericles, Athens grew so powerful that the Athenian Empire could effectively dictate the laws, customs, and trade over all her neighbors in Attica in the islands of the Aegean Sea. The might of the Athenian Empire encouraged an arrogance in Athenian policymakers of the day which grew intolerable to other city-states. When Athenian when Athens sent troops to help Sparta put down a Helot rebellion, the Spartans refused the gesture and sent the Athenian force back home in dishonor, thus provoking the war, which had long been brewing. Later, the, when Athens sent their fleet to help defend its ally, Cogria, against the Corinthian invasion during the Battle of Sibota in 433 BC, their action was interpreted by Sparta as aggression instead of assistance, as Corinth was an ally of Sparta. So you see, when Athens backed up Cor um, Cochrera against Corinthians, it was like it was attacking Sparta, because Sparta's on Corinthian's side. The Peloponnesian War, which took place between 431 and 404 BC, between Athens and Sparta, though it involved directly or indirectly all of Greece, ended in disaster for Athens when it was defeated. Its empire, the wealth decimated, its walls destroyed, only Athens' reputation as a great seat of learning and culture prevented the sack of the city and enslavement of the entire population. So what do you think? Where does the term Dacronian come from? How were Spartan helots different from enslaved people? How was social status primarily determined in Sparta? Was it having a good job, wearing less clothes, having a good car? What was it? Uh, what were some of the effects of the lack of a powerful central state? Like the Persian Empire would have been a big central state. Greece, they didn't have a big central state. So what's going on in Greece? It's so different than the rest of the world.